uh, Joe was, uh, he did his uh, undergrad in physics and then he did his PhD with Chaim Sampolinsky. And Chaim was back in Bar-Yan University. I just learned that he was his first student and only student. And so you can imagine that this is like a Sardut. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but he's here to tell. And, um, uh, and then he did uh, numerous uh, works in physics that I don't understand about oscillations and networks and other things. Uh, and I was introduced uh, about something like, I think, eight years ago, when uh, suddenly he published a paper, an experimental paper on culture, uh, something to do with dendrites. Uh, I was very surprised. So I, I knew his name, but I didn't know his work. So we invited <coughs> him over to Jerusalem with Zidane, and we did a, did a seminar. And it was one of the most heated seminars I remember, because it was like, a, let, let's just say that we ended up agreeing to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it was very interesting and stimulating, so I'm also excited to hear what he's uh, going to talk to us about today, uh, which is, uh, uh, also has to do with theoretical and experimental uh, neuroscience. Um, somehow I, I, I had a lot of, uh, when, when uh, Jonathan asked me to introduce him, and I kind of got the microphone. So I had like an internal debate with myself today. But I feel that uh, today is a special day that and, and it somehow bound in my mind with this argument that we had with uh, Ido. I, I have to say one sentence, I hope you for, forgive me, but the, the, the privilege we have to sit here today and listen to science, you, you shouldn't take it for granted. We enjoy it, it's hard. But it's time that we have to start thinking of fighting for it because it's not obvious, and especially today. So I, I never say something like that in public, <laughs> but today I feel I have to so, you know. so Thank you very much, Mike. And uh, first I would like to send from here uh, full recovery and fast recovery to Jonathan who invited me to, to this talk. So let me start with, uh, let's, let me start uh, expl explaining the first line of my title from theoretical physics to experimental neuroscience. Until 2012, uh, uh, my fields of research were theoretical physics, spin glasses, inverse problems, machine learning, information theory, physical random number generator, and so on. And then in 2012, as full professor, I made a very unusual transition and opened my own wet lab in experimental neuroscience, mainly manipulating neuronal uh, cultures. And I followed the teaching of my supervisor during my postdoc at Princeton University, follow your dreams, Professor Phil Anderson. So let me give you a brief tour of what we are doing in our lab. We are preparing our neuronal cultures uh, uh, after two weeks, hopefully, network is developed. Uh, and then we have a machine combining intra- and extracellular uh, recording and stimulation, and we have to uh, synchronize them up to nanosecond. And we can stimulate and record intracellularly. We can block our cultures, and then we can stimulate dendrites and record and stimulate intracellularly. So let me start with a short a video for the current uh, anatomy of a neuron. Each neuron consists of a soma, dendrites, and an axon. The neurons communicate with each other via connections called synapses. The neuron accumulates its incoming signals from connecting neurons through its dendrites. If the neuronal threshold is crossed, a spike is generated and transmitted to the next connecting neurons via the axon. So the first experiment that uh, we uh, carried out was uh, we stimulate a neuron, let's say at 15 um, hertz, and uh, a neuron gets tired. It takes more time to generate a, a spike. Here is a neuronal response latency measuring the time between stimulation and the Vox spike. 
and the runner response latency increases by few milliseconds until the neuron enters into the intermittent phase uh, where we have some fluctuations around the constant uh, neuronal response latency but with many response failures. And the question is, in this talk, what is the purpose of the, these response failures? So, um, let us uh, uh, continue to the next experiment. We took a neuron and we stimulate uh, at frequency f and we measure the firing frequency fc. And here is a result that independent of f, 10, 12, 15, this neuron fires at 4 or 4.5, sorry, 4.5 uh, hertz and the neuron act like, acts like a low-pass filter. Unlike electronic devices with mass production, here each neuron has a different maximal firing frequency. Here is a neuron where the maximal firing is around 18 Hz. We stimulate the neuron. This is a blocked culture between 20 and 100 Hz. And the question is, what is the purpose of these response failures? So, one of the main puzzles of the brain is how to regulate uh, the firing of the, of the brain. Unlike computer, we cannot turn off the, the, the brain. And uh, typically, the average firing is much less than one hertz. So if each neuron excites two other neurons on the average, then we end up with a migraine always. And uh, if each neuron excites uh, on the average 0.5 uh, neuron, then the um, activity will die out. So the question is how to regulate the firing of the, of the brain. So I would like to present now two mechanisms. The first mechanism is a chain mechanism where we stimulate uh, uh, the chain at 10 hertz and the maximal firing of each node is 7, 3, five, nine, and you already know that after the first one, how do you know? You, you learned so fast, and in a minute we will come to it. And the outcome of the frequency of the chain is three hertz. So a neuron with a low FC acts as a bottleneck suppressing the firing rates towards the lowest FC. Another mechanism is heterogeneous stimulation patterns. As we know, in the brain, we don't have a, a global clock and we have heterogeneous stimulation pattern, uh, patterns. So if we have a neuron that the maximal firing is 10 hertz and we stimulate at 20 hertz, you already know that the firing will be 10 hertz. And if we stimulate at 5 hertz, the firing will be 5 hertz. Now let us alternatingly stimulate the neuron at 25, 25, the average 5 plus 20 divided by 2. Even physicists know that it's 12.5. <laughs> and the firing for, 12, for 20 is 10, for 5 is 5, so the average is below the maximal firing, 7.5, below FC. So we are ready now to put everything on, sim on simulations, emulations, or Langevin equations, but I don't want to come now into details, only to show you the results. So if we take a network and the maximal firing of nodes is between between 6 and 15, the average firing is around 2 hertz or 1.5 hertz below the tail of the distribution. So if I would like to summarize it in a cartoon, if we have some distribution for FC for the maximal firing of each neuron, chain pushes uh, the firing of the network to the tail and heterogeneous even to the tail of the tail, below the tail of the distribution. Now one can do a very simple experiment. You can take a, a, a unblock culture and plot the raster. Here is it only 10 minutes, and you can do it for, for more than 10 mi minutes, and we did it for many cultures. And now you can add bicuculin, and you can block inhibition. And when you block inhibition, you end up with bursty activity. It's well known. But we ask ourselves the following. What is the average? Uh, activity, uh, both is the average spontaneous spike detection with and without bicuculin, only with uh, uh, excitatory or also with in inhibition. And we, su we found that the average spontaneous spike detection rate is only slightly affected by inhibition. So we can conclude that only slightly changes 
uh, the average uh, of firing rate and the mechanism to achieve low firing rate is uh, neuronal plasticity, which leads to low firing rates. And the excitation inhibition balance network is in a big question. Is in a big question which attracted a lot of attention in neuroscience. Uh, so sometimes the bridge between statistical mechanics and neuroscience is misleading. By the way, by the way, a, a, a byproduct of the neuronal plasticity is gamma and theta oscillations, where people are saying that theta and gamma oscillations are playing as a, as a binding mechanism and so on, but this is in our case only a, a, a byproduct of the neuronal uh, plasticity. Now I would like to come to a very recent uh, uh, experiment where we ask ourselves if we have some, uh, 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 or, or there is some uh, application of the response failures uh, uh, on short time scale. So we took a neuron and we stimulated at high frequency. High frequency meaning compared to FC, and we found silence period, non-Poissonian process, which can exceed even several uh, seconds. So what is the purpose of this silence period. So one can say it's biological imitation. Always people told me, well, Ido, oops, what happened? Okay, Ido, welcome. Ido, welcome to, what's happened here? Yeah. It's a welcome to biology, but if we ask ourselves what is the meaning of uh, response failure on a, to on a short time scale. On a short time scale. So I would like to show you today that uh, um, one can achieve reliable sequence identification without recurrent neural networks. Typically, how to identify a sequence of uh, 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 events we are using recurrent neural networks, but what I would like to show you now is that we can achieve a, a sequence identification, high precision sequence identification without recurrent neural networks. So let me show you now the following video. The neuron collects its inputs and transmits a spike to its connecting neurons. However, there are silence periods where the neuron does not respond. Let us compare biological components versus electronic components. Biological components are unreliable, where electronic components are reliable. What is the advantage of unreliable elements with silence periods? Sequence identification. For artificial neural networks without silence nodes, a digit is trained over the entire network. However, for a network with silence nodes, each digit is trained on a different subnetwork. Active nodes in the previous digits are now being silenced. Assume the network has learned the sequence. How can the network identify if the presented sequence is wrong? The trained sub-network of four is silenced. So I would like to, to, to add now two comments. The first one is that if we take, for instance, a network and the test accuracy for a digit is 90%, the probability to identify a sequence of 10, sequ of 10 digits is 0.9 to power 10, which is only 35%. But with silence nodes, we can achieve, again, without recurrent networks, we can achieve accuracy greater than 99%. The second thing is that this mechanism of silence uh, uh, periods 
uh, uh, for sequence identification is robust for the following three imperfections. First, wrong sequence, as we already explained, but also slow sequence and fast sequence compared to the trained network. And there is also some application to, crypt to cryptography, but of course I don't have time and need to, to explain it here. So up to now, we discussed a uh, isotropic neuron. What does it mean, isotropic neuron? That if the maximal firing of the neuron is 10 hertz and we stimulate 8 plus 8 plus 4 from three dendrites, 20 hertz, the transmission probability is 50 percent. But maybe, the trans maybe FC is a phenomenon which has to be attributed to the dendrites, and we have different FC for each dendrite. So how to do it? or how to uh, uh, explain or to, to verify it in the experiment. So we have again our neuron dendrites and blue and red uh, uh, um, extracellular uh, uh, electrodes and uh, we can stimulate our patch neuron. So we have two stimulation scheduling. One is 500 uh, stimulations, 15 hertz from blue and then 500 stimulation from red. But we add also um, um, uh, another kind of stimulation, one blue, one red, one blue and one uh, red, in order to exclude claims of people in neuroscience, which are very uh, critical, to say that after we stimulate 500 times uh, uh, blue, we change the neuron. So let's see the answer of the neuron. It's only an example. So we see here the neuronal response latency. And here, response probability measured between 0 and 1 using sliding windows. And here is for one blue, one red, for the second uh, type of uh, scheduling. So it's quite clear that we have FC here, 1, 12, 15, and 2. And we have different FC for different dendrite. So uh, FC is something which happened in the dendrite and not in the soma. So conclusions, there is a recovery of response failure when we switch between the electrodes also here. And we have different FC as we already discussed. And we have different neuronal response uh, latency um, um, for different, of course, uh, dendrites. So again, FC is a phenomenon which has to be uh, uh, attributed to, to, to the dendrite and not to the synapse. So let me summarize in a short video. Up to now, we stimulate a neuron above threshold, and let us now try to stimulate a neuron sub-threshold. So, the first, let us uh, uh, remind you the standard uh, neuronal model as a threshold unit. What does it mean? We have here three dendrites, and we stimulate, and the central spring uh, accumulates the, um, the input. And if the input is below threshold, no evoke spike, if it is above threshold, like in this case, demo, then there is an evoke spike. This is an old assumption, century old assumption by Louis Lapic, integrate and fire a neuron. And we ask if this model is correct. So we propose two other models, nonlinear dendritic transmission, where uh, uh, what does it mean, nonlinear dendritic transmission? So we have here for each dendrite, we have a spring. If it's below, no uh, transmission to the central spring. If it is above threshold of the dendrite, there is a transmission to the central spring, but no evoke spike. If it is both dendrites above threshold and above the threshold of the central spring, there is an evoke spike. So this is nonlinear dendritic transmission. And the last one model is multiple threshold units. No central spring. For each dendrite, we have a spring. And if it's above threshold, uh, the dendrite generates a spike. And different spike waveform for each dendrite. So our question is, we have again three models, standard, nonlinear dendritic transmission, 
and multiple threshold unit without a central spring, and we ask how to experimentally examine which is the correct neuronal model. So we come back to our system. It's very difficult experiment. We have two dendrites. We have intra and extracellular recording. We have to keep stability over all the experiment and to see that uh, everything is stable during the latencies and leaky leaks and so on during uh, the experiment beginning beginning at the end. And let us now stimulate two dendrites at very low stimulation rate. Why very small stimulation rate? Very low because otherwise people here will claim that there is an interface between consecutive stimulations and let's see the outcome of the neuron. Two different spike waveforms. Here is more examples. Two different spike waveforms. So let us uh, summarize this. experimental observation indicates different spike waveforms for each dendrite. Experiments are performed on neuronal cultures where connections between neurons are excluded and dendrites are stimulated via extracellular electrodes. Each dendrite has its own threshold. The neuron generates a different spike waveform for each dendrite when its threshold is crossed. We see here experimentally reported different spike waveforms from each dendrite. So it cannot fit with the standard model, nonlinear model, and we end up with multiple threshold units. However, uh, people in neuroscience are looking for more support, so we have to give more support. So here we take a, a neuron, we measure the threshold of one dendrite and the second dendrite, and we stimulate both of them, one after the other, simultaneously, and one after the other. And we would like to see, and we know that 85 plus 85 is greater than 100. And let's see the result of the neuron. No evoke spike. Also, we stimulate 85 from here and 85 from here, so no special summation for different extracellular electrode. So it cannot fit with the first model, the standard one. But we continue. It's very difficult to control latencies and timing from two uh, um, 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 dendrite to extracellular stimulation, so we continue with intracellular and extracellular stimulation, one after the other, simultaneously, and so on, and they have a different spike waveform. And we see here small depolarization, but no evoke spike. Also, 75 plus 75 is greater than 100. Here is a counter or counter example, and uh, we have um, intracellular and extracellular stimulation, and they have the same spike waveform. And we give one after the other simultaneously, and let's see the result of the neuron. In all cases, we have evoke spike. So spatial summation occurs for similar intra and extracellular spike waveform. So it cannot fit the first model. We continue. We give nine, minus 90% intracellular, and we end up here with strong hyperpolarization. And we give only 110 extracellular one after the other simultaneously. So we know that minus 90 pollutes 110, it's only plus 20% of the threshold. And they have a different spike waveform. Let's see the result of the neuron. In all cases, we obtained a VOC spike. So spatial summation, no spatial summation for intra and extracellular electrodes when they have a different spike waveform. So it cannot fit this one, the f standard, nonlinear, and we end up with multiple threshold unit. But now I would like to show you a non-local measurement. Up to now, all experiment where, where we have to control very precisely the timing of two stimulations. So how to do that? So can we show that a neuron functions as a multiple threshold units using non-local measurements? So we took two electrodes with reliable responses at one hertz, and FC is very low. And they have a different spike waveform. 
Now we add intracellular stimulation. And please remember, intracellular and, and green, they have the same spike waveform, which differ from the pink. Again, intra and green are similar, and pink is different. And we stimulate now 8 hertz and 1 hertz from here. 8 hertz and 1 hertz from here. And here is a snapshot of the result. You see no response failure although it's above FC. And the time difference between two uh, uh, stimulations is around 100 or 110 milliseconds. Now we repeat the same experiment where we stimulate 8 Hz and 1 Hz from green. And we see many response failures. So the conclusion is that non-local effects accumulate when spike waveforms are similar. So the FC acts when the spike waveform is, is similar and we don't need to control precisely the timing. So the conclusion is that these two models are excluded and we left with neuron as a multiple threshold unit. And we can ask now what is the computational capabilities of such a neuron and what is the underlying mechanism. But I will not discuss it now. So let me summarize it. The second experimental observation indicates that a neuron functions as multiple threshold units. A spike is not generated when two dendrites are weakly stimulated simultaneously. However, if the two stimulations were given to the same dendrite, an evoked spike would be generated. Hence, a spatial summation is absent between different dendrites. Okay, now I would like to present only a video of a recent experiment without presenting uh, uh, the data. And this is an isotropic absolute refractory period. Fourth experimental observation indicates that each dendrite has a different absolute refractory period. After a neuron generates a spike, it cannot generate another spike for about two milliseconds. The old neuron. The silencing period is called the absolute refractory period. Then, the neuron enters a relative refractory period with stuttering activity until full responsiveness is achieved. The new Recent neuron. experiments indicate that each dendrite has a different absolute refractory period, which can exceed 20 milliseconds. After this period, the neuron returns to full activity without an intermediate phase of relative refractory period. The new findings reveal that the absolute refractory periods can be 10 times longer than was previously assumed, where each dendrite has a different refractory period. The new neuron is found to be a very precise element with a sharp transition from the refractory period to full responsiveness without an intermediate stutter phase. And without, without hyperpolarization. So I just finished with a new neuron and let me now move to the new type of learning. So all of us are familiar with the bridge between uh, brain uh, dynamics and machine learning. Here we have two presynaptic pre neurons and postsynaptic neuron, and in between we have the synapses. And uh, the synapses are the tunable parameters, like the tunable parameters in feedforward networks. So this is the origin of machine learning. Now, what are the biological learning rules? Like something like STDP, spike time dependent plasticity. I'm sure all of you are familiar, but let me repeat it. So if we have an above threshold stimulation from one uh, root generating a spike, followed by a sub threshold stimulation from another root, this is one version of STDP, then the strength of the synapse will increase here and here. And in vice versa situation, if we first have a sub threshold stimulation from this root, followed by above threshold stimulation from this root, then the strength of the synapse will decrease. Timings are very important in biology, not the mean field theory. 
So when I learned about it, I asked myself where learning occurs, in the dendrites or in the synapses. So the first reaction of uh, leading figures in, in neuroscience uh, was, who cares? Because if you put an amplifier here or here, it's the same thing. You multiply by factor, sorry, you multiply by factor two your uh, uh, signal here or here, it's basically the same. But we will see that it's a big difference. The second comment of leading figure was, uh, Ido, please go and take elementary course in neuroscience in LSEC. Okay, but fortunately I didn't take. Okay, so we blocked our cultures. We blocked our cultures. And now we repeat the same STDP on the dendrites. We repeat the same type of experiment on the dendrite. And let's see the result of the experiment. So we did it also on two uh, uh, dendrites, but as we know, we can do it also intracellularly and extracellularly. So we give a pair, which is above threshold stimulation intracellular, followed a few milliseconds later, sub-threshold stimulation from uh, extracellular stimulation, and we have to control the, uh, the latency. And we repeat this pair 50 times at one hertz. The time lag between pairs is one second. And let's see the result of the neuron, the dendrite. So here is the initial responses at 900 millivolt, 800, 700 millivolt before training. So we see here some local depolarization. It's not uh, EPSP because no synapses. It's some depolarization and the height, let's say, is nine. And this is after, after meaning after three, five minutes, we see here enhancement of 24 compared to nine, 14 compared to six. So it's a very strong adaptation in a f by a factor of 2.5. And again, synapses only, uh, dendrites only. When we flip the order of the pair, first sub-threshold and then above threshold, we see weakening. Here, let's say 14, and here is 5. So again, by factor 2 or 3. So we see a very strong uh, 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 adaptation in 3, 5 minutes compared to 30 minutes and more in synaptic plasticity, what people believe synaptic plasticity. Surprisingly, we can repeat the same experiment at 5 hertz where we, give, where we gave pairs, uh, the time lag between pairs was 0.2 second, and we can measure adaptation. Technically, it's very, very complicated how to do it. You have to move from one system to another one and synchronize them, but we can see adaptation in 10 seconds, 10 seconds only. Here is the initial response before training, and this is after 10 seconds, and you can see more and more enhanced adaptation as the time goes on. So you see adaptation after 10 seconds. So this 10 seconds compared to 30 seconds in synaptic plasticity or more. So if I would like to, clo uh, to, to conclude now the dritic learning, the dritic learning occurs very close to the computational element, the soma. And if a soma is a person, the distance of the uh, synapses is like the uh, uh, top of a skyscraper. And here we have like small, very small and sensitive valves. The second thing is very fast, few seconds compared to 30 seconds. And this last thing, dend uh, dendritic is less noisy because synaptic plasticity, what people believe backpropagating signal, has to go through varying uh, conducting parts of them of the dendrite, and this is a very noisy uh, process. Another thing which is very important, it's, it's uh, result in a new type of nonlinear dynamics because increasing the strengths of the dendrite is effectively increasing the strengths of all synapses connecting to this dendrite. So it's different to put an amplifier here or here because if you put an amplifier here, you amplify all uh, uh, the thousand synapses connecting to this uh, dendrite, so a new type of, uh, and, it, and therefore it's also less uh, sensitive. Another thing is 
that as we know when we when you simulate uh, synaptic plasticity on a network you end up with unrealistic value uh, strengths above threshold or sub threshold so typically in neuroscience so you add more and more mechanism or more and more stories in order to solve the problem but here in dendritic uh, learning you have oscillating strengths and not only oscillating strengths you end up with log normal distribution for the dendritic strengths so let me summarize it in the following video. We turn now to the paradox of synaptic learning. Synaptic learning is based on backpropagating signal from the soma to the dendrite after an evoked spike. This slow adaptation mechanism results in strengthening or weakening of the synapse. To understand the paradox of synaptic learning, let us look at the neuronal scale. If a neuron is represented by a person's body, then a synapse is represented by his fingers, and the length of his arms would be as tall as a skyscraper. The first paradox is that learning occurs far away from the soma, as if the disk and the CPU in a computer were very distant. The second paradox is that learning is slow and noisy and can take up to hours. The third paradox is that learning is sensitive to stimulation timings and different conducting features. The new type of experiments indicates dendritic learning as a paradigm shift in brain learning. The blue dendrite is stimulated and generates an evoked spike. This is followed by stimulation of the red dendrite, which does not evoke a spike. This procedure causes a strengthening of the red dendrite, making it now easier to generate a spike. The first experimental observation is that learning occurs in closer proximity to the soma. Dendritic learning represents a global learning and is equivalent to the strengthening or weakening of all incoming synapses to the dendrite. Second, the learning is much faster and takes several seconds only. Third, dendritic learning can occur in different branches of the dendritic tree. This is a new type of experiment. I would like now to uh, comment because I know people here, some people here or some researchers are uh, doing dendritic uh, computations. There is a main difference between dendritic computation and dendritic learning. In dendritic uh, computation, uh, uh, the strengths are fixed, where here we have time dependent uh, strengths, and I would like to repeat it. That while in dendritic computation, dendritic strengths are fixed, in dendritic learning, the strengths are changing dynamically. Now I would like to start to move to a theory, but to theory. But before that, I would like uh, to ask or to uh, to find uh, the biological origin of input causes. What is input causes? Input causes is an is, is a weight which is going between two inputs and influence the output. Instead of W I J, you have W I J K, and it's a well known in computer science that if you use input causes, then you can uh, uh, um, find or you can improve success rate. Here is an example, never mind what is uh, the architecture. This is optimized success rate, success, uh, rate uh, error rate uh, without uh, input causes and with input causes. And we see that we can reduce uh, uh, error rate uh, using input causes. So what is the biological origin for input causes? We have here input I and input J, presynaptic neuron and, uh, and uh, K is a postsynaptic neuron. So we have WIK and you have WJK. But we don't have an element going between I, J, and K directly. So what is the biological origin of input crosses? This question bothered me for a long time. And the answer is dendritic nonlinear amplification. And I would like now to convince you using the following uh, video. In dendritic learning, the dendrite functions as a nonlinear amplifier. The outcome of two signals is their amplified signal. And in addition, the product of the two amplified signals. Nonlinear term. This is the source for the emergence of input process. We now step up from learning on biological dendritic trees 
to learning on an artificial tree network. Here, a single neuron implements a multi-layer network, including input crosses. In artificial neural networks, the number of loops between an output unit and a weight is large. These enormous calculations are performed using fast and parallel GPUs. This difficulty is solved on a tree architecture, since there is only one route from the output to each weight. Application of... Okay, I would like now to move to series. This is the last part of my talk, the last 10 minutes. And uh, I would like to show you how uh, learning on tree architecture inspired by dendritic tree, we can bring closer brain dynamics to solve uh, uh, um, real problems in, in deep learning. So this is the main goal of the last part of my talk, and this is really a new, uh, a new part of our uh, work in our lab. So all of us are familiar with the statement that deep learning stems from human brain dynamics. However, these two learning scenarios are essentially different in the following aspects. In the brain, we have five, seven feed-forward uh, layers. This is what neurophysiologists told us. And in deep learning, we have dozens and hundreds of feed-forward networks. Convolutional layers. In the brain, we have, let's say, one or almost one close to the retina. It's very approximated uh, 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 convolutional layer. In a deep layer, most of the layers are convolutional layers. The last one is backpropagation, which is realistic in deep learning where we use GPUs, and it's unrealistic in brain dynamics. So the question that I would like to discuss with you now is how we can achieve the same success rate in this deep learning with all these constraints. So first, let me come back to backpropagation, why it's unrealistic and realistic in deep learning. So here is uh, uh, what was known as a deep, learn, a deep architectures today, to architecture today, it's a shallow architecture, ELINET five, five layers. We have here the first convolutional layer, the second convolutional layer, fully connected, fully connected, fully connected. Never mind what is the details of this architecture for you, but it's important to, to understand that the number of routes connecting an output to a weight in the input is more than a million. This is all these red lines here. So in a GPU, we can calculate the derivative uh, uh, of all these millions of uh, roots and sum them up here simultaneously, and then we know how to update the weight. But in the brain, it's clear that we cannot calculate all these derivatives synchronously and sum them up in a weight. So Un, uh, uh, backpropagation is unrealistic. So we proposed recently three architecture inspired by dendritic tree, only three layers. Never mind now what are the details. We have here the first layer, the second layer, and the third layer, and it's a tree architecture. In a tree architecture, it's a, it is clear that there is one route between the output and each weight. By the way, here you have the rule for updating the weight. So delta W is nothing else but the output times the input times the weight in between. When you use, for instance, ReLU activation function. So it's quite uh, easy to see that it's quite clear. It's not bio uh, 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 bio still bi a biological uh, prescription, but it's much closer to biological prescription on a tree architecture. But the question is, if one can achieve with three, with three layers only, the same success rate as with five layers with two convolutional layers. So this is the question that we asked. And here is the result. On a non-trivial data set, which is known as a CIFAR-10, ELINET optimized parameter give you 0 0.75. 0 0.75. And on a, with a tree, we can even outperform this success rate and we come close to 80% with only three layers on a tree architecture. This is true also for online learning where we use one epoch or half a epoch and so on for uh, ELINET 
five layers, one, uh, the, the, uh, the optimized success rate is 0.82, and here we end up with 60. So we see that three architectures, where the prescription for backpropagation is very easy, uh, we can uh, outperform even the success rate of uh, LENET consistent of five layers and two convolutional layers and few fully connected layers. So this is the first result. And by the way, we have here highly pruned tree backpropagation. Why? Because almost all nodes are zero or effectively zero in the case of sigmoid. Never mind what are the details, but almost all nodes are, are zero. For instance, in the first layer, 0.97% of the nodes are zero, meaning that we don't need to update them. So we can save this energy. So on a tree architecture, the back propagation is very efficient, and uh, uh, most of the operations are, are excluded. Now, I'm coming to the question, if one can achieve with five or seven layer, let's say, feed-forward layer, the same uh, success rate that we can achieve with deep learning. So here is well-known uh, uh, architecture in, in computer science or deep learning architectures known as the VGG16. You have here 13 convolutional layers, and you have three fully connected layers far away from the brain dynamics. And this is, by the way, the CIFAR-10 uh, uh, database. It's not an easy database. And uh, by the way, uh, even for human, it's not easy to classify uh, uh, this uh, 32 by 32 pixels pictures. So the question is, if one can, so what are the questions that we are asking? If one can achieve the same success rate with five layers than with 16 layers, can we find a universal behavior characterizing 16 layers and 5 layers? And can we find an efficient theory how to build this tower of convolutional layers? So I would like to answer all these questions in the next five minutes. So first, we found, first we extended what people are doing in computer science to a family of networks. So in computer science, they use what is known LENET. You have here six filters, and in here you have 16 filters, and they try to, to optimize it. What we did, we took here D1 filters and D2 filters, but we keep D1 divided by D2 to equal to 6 over 16. So we took an architecture and we extended it to a family of networks. And for each D1, we calculate the optimized rate error as a function of D1, and we found a power law. We found a power law. We did the same thing for VGG16, and we found also a power law with a very similar uh, exponent. So we see that E is a function of number of uh, filters in the first layer decays to zero as a power law. Now, if you extrapolate this power law, you can find the same success rate for five and 16 layers. So with shallow networks, we can achieve the same success rate that we achieved with deep learning. So this is the first statement. The second statement is how to build this tower of convolutional layers. So we found a conservation law that if in the first layer the size of the filter is m times m and we use d filters, if in the second bunch of convolutional layers the size of the filter is m over 2 by m over 2, we need to take 2d filters. Therefore, there is, a there is a conservation law that the number of convolutional filters times the size of the convolutional filter should be equal to constant in order to optimize success rate, and we claim that in such a way we preserve signal-to-noise ratio. Now, the last thing. I said before that we can achieve with five layers the same success rate as with 16 layers. But what about the complexity? Because in order to achieve the same success rate, I need to take many, many, many filters in the first convolutional layer. So we calculate the complexity. How you measure the complexity is measured by MADD, multiplication and add operations during a pass feedward pass and backward pass. 
and we calculate it for the same epsilon for VGG16 and LINET. And we found that the complexity of LINET divided by VGG is less than one, meaning that we can achieve with shallow, this is in favor of brain dynamics here, that we found that in shallow architectures we can achieve the same success rate as with deep learning, but with much less complexity. So this is in favor of brain dynamics. So I just come to the conclusion of my talk and accelerated brain dynamics to gigahertz will boost AI capabilities where the sky is the limit. So some selected references in the movies. The videos were prepared by my student, a PhD student. Maybe she selected the wrong <laughs> subject for a PhD. So, oops, sorry. So this is the end of my talk. Depends on epsilon. Depends, but it can be, let's say, ten times, five times more efficient than deep learning. Than deep learning. The other question had to do with the way you train the network and the number of uh, epochs. So, that is the training different from the two models? It was the same number of epochs, the same number of epochs for both uh, architectures and it was for, the complexity was measured for, for, let's say, for each input, but then you can multiply it by uh, the, the number of, um, of uh, inputs and number of epochs and so on. And the loss function that we use in auto, is there such The a same, the same loss function. So all the other things are equal? Equal, yeah, the equal. The only thing that it's based on, on, on the extrapolation of, uh, no, the extrapolation for small epsilon is based on the, the, the result for small epsilon, not for, let's say, 0.1 or 0.05 epsilon, is based on uh, uh, the power law extrapolation. Because it's very difficult. The main difference between what we are doing and people are doing in computer science is the people in computer science, they have like a set of uh, parameters that they are using. They call it the best set of parameters. We carefully optimize for each number of uh, filters for each D, we optimized uh, as, uh, as, uh, the parameters. We optimize the parameters. And this is not common in, there are few papers, but it's not common in uh, the field of computer science. Two somewhat related questions. <coughs> so you showed us that uh, we can treat the number of epochs as the performance of uh, LE-NET. Yeah. And the next one was comparison between VG16 to LINET architecture with, uh, with more filters. Now, is there a direct comparison between, let's say, a tree architecture with more than five or six and something that is state of the art, like? Not at the moment. Right. That the scale not at I not at the moment. I believe it's the same, but not at the moment. Not at the moment. And another related question is that um, you presented. The we are working in this direction, but not at the moment. Okay. So the more general one is um, when you say that the brain learns differently than what networks do in terms of propagation, et cetera, et cetera. An, ex an answer that somebody could give is that feed-forward network is not a good model of the brain, which also utilize, utilizes the current connections. You said at the beginning that we don't need them from temporal sequences, et cetera, but there's no question that the brain does have uh, long-range connections and a current -range connections. So um, maybe that could be part of the reason. Like Possible. You know, people are using on computer uh, science skip connections, what is known. One can try to use skip connections here, and if you use skip connection, it's still a tree. It's still a tree. But uh, we, we didn't use it yet, uh, but one can use uh, skip connections, what is known in computer science. But you won't have a single output input. Ah. Yeah, you still have single, you still have single, single output, si single route between output and, and, and weight. It, it's, 
the tree, the tree is a tree to, to a weight, not to a node. It's very important. It's a different, as, a different uh, concept. It's tree with respect to, to weights and not tree with respect to nodes, because you can have two, no, two, two weights coming out of, of, of a node in the input. Yes? Um, I have a question about, I have a few questions about the first part of your talk. So, how are, why are you doing the, the stimulations in the dendrites? What is the exact, are you putting an electric, uh, like an electrode somewhere near the dendrite of interest? Yeah. So, in that case, these differences in the waveforms could be from uh, exciting other axons, right? So, they can be feed forward. Uh, signals that you see. Yeah, you, you, if I understand correctly, you ask if you have multiple paths of uh, stimulation of the soma uh, using this extracellular uh, stimulation. So we can distinguish between such uh, multiple passes in the neuronal response latency. If you see in the neuronal response latency few uh, different, let's say, branches, the meaning that in such a case, and then we excluded such an experiment. We, we take only uh, cases where you have, uh, let's say, a precise and, uh, and we can uh, repeat the same uh, profile of a neuron response latency again and again in, in several experiments. Because each such experiment uh, consists of many, many uh, 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 experiments where we excite the same neuron. We have to measure the, the, the latency at the beginning, at the end, in order to, to see that the timing is, 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 is correct and uh, does not change during the, the time of our experiment and so on. I would like to comment in general that in neuroscience, from my point of view, uh, there is a problem, like in quantum mechanics. Because typically in neuroscience, you would like to know exactly what you are doing. But when you, are, when you know exactly what you are doing, you influence your, 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 your system. And you don't know exactly how to solve itself consistently. So people believe that, that it's okay. I believe the right way to, to, to find, let's say, general result in neuroscience is, is to, to excite from, let's say, remote sensing, let's say, in remote sensing, and, 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 and try to control the measurements, but without affecting much the, the, the network or the neurons that you are measuring. So you have to balance, you know, you don't, you, you cannot know exactly what you are doing, and uh, you need to know very close this population, like, uh, very close to, to where you are uh, stimulate uh, the dendrite or the soma, or never mind what, otherwise you influence uh, uh, the system and Typically, you don't know how. How come? Right, but for example, you can have like two, two electrodes close to the same dendrite, right? Then stimulate ones with this one, ones with that one, and see if the waveforms are matching. Yeah, but so first we have fluorescence image. Okay, in some cases, as I, as I presented. And then we know that we excite two different uh, dendrites. And uh, typically, you can uh, uh, exclude such cases again with if you have an exp uh, uh, many experience from the type of the neuronal response latency. Because if you excite two different branches of the same dendrite, typically it's, uh, uh, you will end up with very similar, very similar uh, neuronal, uh, uh, neuronal response latency, and sometimes you have an interference if you stimulate both of them uh, simultaneously or in a, in a very short time lag. And uh, the other question I have is this dendrite dependent FC dependency and the dendrite specific FC dependency that you are showing, can that be explained by the electronic properties of the dendrites? By? Uh, can that be explained by the, like, the cable properties of the dendrites? Uh, I if you just take a, in, the, the, the simulation software neuron and just do the same experiments in, in a simulated manner, would you see the same things? I'm just Trying to understand what the underlying mechanism would be. Would I don't know. I don't know what is the underlying mechanism. But can it be explained by possible? Cable possible. I would like only to add. I think I forgot uh, to mention it in my talk that what we found about dendritic learning is irreversible on a time scale of our experiment. 
So we find strengthening of the dendrite, and then we repeat our measurements of the response of the uh, neuron to different stimulation uh, amplitudes. And um, typically, and you know, after one hour, we, lo we lose stability, but after, at least after one hour, the adaptation is irreversible. Is irreversible. We cannot exclude, you know, that after three hours, uh, something happened and there is a decay. But we didn't see a decay on, on a time scale, let's say, of the stability of our experiment, which is after we did all our experiment, let's say it's half an hour, 40 minutes, or something like that. So this is the first time that you have a uh, 